like to welcome everyone to this uh, very special event hosted by the Green Climate Fund's Independent Integrity Unit, also known as IIU, as part of its Integrity Talk series. Uh, my name is Mike Kemte Kim. I am the Chief of Investigations at the IIU. It is a tremendous pleasure to have with us today our esteemed speaker, Duncan Smith, former Deputy Head of Fraud Investigations at the European Investment Bank in Luxembourg. At the EIB, Duncan was responsible for policy development, outreach, and training amongst many other duties before retiring at the end of last year. Prior to joining the EIB, he worked at the World Bank INT's Investigation Unit in Washington, DC, as a team leader and policy advisor. During the earlier part of his career, he tackled fraud and corruption cases in the United Kingdom, including at the Department of Trade and Industry and at the Serious Fraud Office. Duncan is a UK lawyer who has uh, written articles for the Basel Institute on Governance and the Journal of Financial Compliance, and has given presentations to a wide range of audiences, including at conferences, uh, universities, and on podcasts. He joined the peer review teams of the investigation functions at the WHO uh, and the European Patent Office. And he's written two books, one entitled Promoting Integrity in the Work of International Organizations, and another titled Fraud and Corruption, Cases and Materials. Uh, and he's currently working on a third book, which is on the topic of money laundering. And he'll um, get into uh, some of that book, uh, some of the content of that book later. Thank you very much for joining us today, Duncan. Uh, I know that um, you've uh, remained very busy after your long uh, service at the EIB. Um, I just want to ask you, how has 2024 uh, been so far for you? Hello, Mike, and hello, all the participants. I, I've i enjoyed um, retirement, but it's been very busy preparing text on this new book. And my daughter got married and various other things, personal issues. So I'm having a busy time. It, it's bizarre to say, but I'm as busy as I used to be when I worked. Um, I would just like to make one point, Mike, before we start. And that is, in terms of the books that I've had published by Springer, um, I'm happy to raise awareness about the issues and give people, practitioners, students, the opportunity to read them and think about the issues. Maybe in an out-of-the-box experience, they can come up with some, some new proposals to resolve these things. But also, I'm not doing it for the money. I donate all of the proceeds that I receive from Springer to a UK-based charity for brain injury called Headway, and so far, we've given maybe more than a thousand euros to Headway. And I'm happy because not only do the books raise awareness of the issues and give people a chance to re review the issues, but also that I'm able to, to be a, a positive influence for Headway as well. That's terrific, uh, Duncan. Um, I think that uh, it's really special when you can uh, share your experience and expertise, um, you know, with the public, with those uh, practitioners who are interested, but at the same time, um, contribute to society, um, helping those uh, in need, um, you know, through through that experience and and really sharing the wealth of the knowledge that you have. So very much looking forward to it. Um, I also encourage our um, audience today um, to take interest uh, in this topic, uh, as well as the books that um uh, Duncan uh, uh, has published. Uh, so um, getting into um, some of the um, more technical areas that um, I wanted to cover uh, during today's session, um, many of your books and speaking engagements I've noticed have focused on addressing fraud and corruption uh, in projects that are funded by multilateral development banks, also known as MDBs. In your experience, what are some unique challenges uh, and risks associated with uh, detecting and addressing fraud and corruption in international financial institutions like the, the MDBs? Mike, I think it's common for the MDBs and for other organizations as well, that these are high profile and high value contracts are at stake. Um, and, and companies, um, unfortunately, think it's worth lying and cheating and bribing to try to get one so that there is some intense pressure to, to, to award those contracts. And we would hope that integrity would prevail and that the best company that can supply the products or make 
or build or, or provide the services would win the contract. But that's not always the case. And unfortunately, human nature being as it is, um, there is a big temptation to try to benefit personally out of these things. So there is, you know, there's some fairly basic fraud and corruption issues, bribery to be awarded the contract, misrepresentations in procurement processes um, to try to win the contract, false documents and overstatement of invoices about how much it took, uh, how much time it took and how much money it took to, to, to deliver these products. Um, and, you know, do the does the overall process match the technical specifications and what the project is supposed to be? So I think, you know, there are significant reputational risks of integrity violations, which don't um, um, have the same sort of process as a domestic law enforcement backed agency. You know, if you're doing this for a government, there are law enforcement powers that would kick in automatically if there were some suspicions of fraud or corruption. But in these cases, you know, global projects with, with um, implementation around the world with multinational organizations, there is always the possibility of fraud and corruption. And with publicity, either positive about what, what the government or what, what the agency is doing, or negative about the, the mess that fraud and corruption has develop these projects into. Yeah, definitely. And and also, I, I just to add on uh, to that, I, I guess the large amount of funding that goes into um, development projects um, is something that, um, you know, perpetrators of fraud and corruption are are looking out for. And, and it's it, it provides them an opportunity um, to make a buck um, out of right. out of um, these international organizations, um, and that sort of leads on to the next question that I have. Um, and in one of your books, promoting integrity in the work of international organizations, you you actually discuss a number of methods that um, you know MDBs employ to prevent fraud and corruption in development projects. And you mentioned things like proactive integrity reviews, you know, best practice reports, and disclosure of agents. Um, in your experience, what has been some of the most effective tools um, to prevent fraud and corruption um, in, in these development projects? Well, I think it's very important to have a framework within which these projects can be um, implemented properly and according to plan. And to deter and prevent fraud and corruption can be quite important. And it's not just about how we found it, how we find it and what we do about it when we find it, but also it's about prevention and deterrence. So, you know, the MDBs have adapted um, the sanctions and there's now not just sanctioning of an entity, but cross debarment of an entity that's been engaged. So the risks of the same entity doing the same sort of thing in a similar project financed by another organization has, has diminished significantly. Um, but it's not just about punishment, it's about deterrence and prevention. And I think proactive integrity reviews have developed in the last few years as quite a positive way to identify weaknesses and gaps in the project and in the processes that the project is being implemented using um, without the, the necessarily without there being a complaint of fraud or corruption yet, um, because those issues haven't developed. But, you know, if we can identify what the weaknesses are and put in place on the basis of some recommendations, you know, matters to fix those problems, then there's less of a risk that fraud and corruption can affect the project. And, you know, there are um, many, many situations um, that can be read about in the annual reports of EIB and the World Bank and all sorts of other organizations where these proactive integrity reviews have been used to, um, to strengthen the project and to avoid fraud and corruption. It's not just about um, acting, actually finding it, it's about deterring it and preventing it. So to the extent that, you know, the, the weaknesses are filled and the, the, um, the proactive reviews 
can uh, mi mitigate the problems uh, and minimize the problems. I think those two things are, are very, are very powerful. Um, you know, but but there are fundamental things that you know you need a fraud policy. You need to tell people what the risks are and what the problems are going to be if those if those entities decide to try to breach it. You need, uh, albeit an administrative process, to to investigate them. So there's no necessarily law enforcement, as we talked about earlier. There's no law enforcement, but it can go to law enforcement if there are national um, uh, issues at stake uh, in a particular country. Normally, that there, there are uh, fraud and corruption would have breached a national law, and therefore um, uh, law enforcement would be of interest. And. You know, as you mentioned, the EIB has a covenant of integrity that bidders have to submit as part of their bids. And the World Bank has a disclosure of agency fees that are paid, which can sometimes, unfortunately, quite often become bribes that the uh, the company pay through the agent to the awarding um, um, uh, government official. Um, so, you know, there are a bunch of tools out there that that um, flag the issues and um, uh, and um, and try to to minimise the problems, but uh, you know fraud and corruption will always be there. Human nature is unfortunately um, uh, that people will try to benefit personally uh, and to bribe people. They they will benefit a lot, uh, but that is not necessarily the best way to run a project. And you know to to the extent that these tools make people more accountable for their decisions. And if, if there are problems, you know, there can be an investigation um, that's facilitated by the process and the contract and, you know, uh, the ability of the investigators to go and look at sites and look at what's being delivered, the projects. Um, it's, it's very useful to be able to, to, um, to tell people that actually, you know, if there is a problem, then, um, you know, if there's fraud and corruption on, on on your implementation of this aspect of the project, then you're going to be accountable for that. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, just as a follow up question, based on your experience, uh, what has been the perhaps role or value of um, contractual provisions um, you know, between um, a donor entity and a fund recipient in regards to certain provisions um, that enforce uh, integrity, allow for certain um, monitoring. Um, how has that worked um, in the um, institutions that um, you uh, served and, um, and what types of value do you think uh, brought, uh, were brought from that? I think, um... The inspection rights in contracts are very important because if if they're not there or or um, there is some uncertainty about whether we can do that or whether the agency can do that or or the investigators can do that the funding agency can do that there's always going to be some people that will will um, engage in the misconduct but then refuse. To, be, to allow people to go and inspect the books and records or the, the sites where the, the project have been implemented. And it's really important. You know, it's it's important for, for specialists to go and look at the bridge and see if it's been reinforced as per the technical specifications. It's really important to go and inspect the products that have been delivered according to a contract and to see whether they match the technical specifications. You know, I've looked at cases many many cases where you know contracts were to deliver products and those products don't match the technical specifications in one fairly extreme example i had tractors delivered and they weren't new tractors at all they were old tractors repainted <laughs> it's just extraordinary what people think they can get away with especially if they think there is no right of inspection and you know to the extent that the right of inspection is important. It's, you know, it's important to go and witness what has been delivered versus what the technical specifications describe it as. The, 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 that, that's true of 
not just the sites in terms of the project, but also the books and records of the contractor or the consultant. You know, I've had a, a number of cases where we've had to, to delve over, over many hours through the books and records of the contractor concerned. And in many cases, we found, you know, um, um, bribe payments or payments to officials or 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 some sort of identification of the problems that they've encountered and and tried to resolve with fraud and corruption. So the the inspection right of the sites, but also of the books and records held by the agency, but also held by the contractors is very important to 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 be become aware of those things, but also to resolve them. You know, I think I think the proactive integrity reviews or detailed implementation reviews that the MDBs do, I think are, are based on the ability to, to inspect and to find those weaknesses and those gaps in the processes uh, aren't, aren't likely if, if there's no possibility to go and look. So I think, you know, from deterrence, but also from um, identification of issues and resolving them, I think, I think the inspection rights are really important. Yeah, I think those are some uh, very good points. Um, and and in terms of uh, you know these audit and inspection rights, um, you know they uh, allow for you know initiatives like PIRs um, for investigations uh, of alleged or suspected uh, prohibited practices, um, and they're and they're very valuable in terms of uh, the integrity offices of. Um, financial institutions um, to to undertake their work. Um, the GCF, uh, Mike, um, is, so, so, sure. Sorry to interrupt. I think it's important that it's not to recognise that it's not just the MDBs that do that. You know, there are some UN agencies that are doing that. I think UNDP and the World Food Programme do that as well. So it's not something that's just linked or, or being developed by the MDBs. I, I think. You know, to the to the extent that the CII recognizes the benefit, those guidelines are now published on the website of the CII. So, to the extent that anybody's interested to go and look at them, I think you know there are some very positive benefits to financing agencies to be able to have a look at the, this in a proactive way. And I think it's important also for people to understand that what investigators do in those processes, in those methodologies, is similar to an audit. You know, we, we, we are tracing stuff, we are looking at the processes, but we do it with an investigative mindset. So we are more skeptical, we're more curious. And, you know, there are site visits, there are detailed reviews of documents and data analysis. And to the extent that we use forensic accounting techniques, you know, I think those are important, not just to resolve whether or not there's an issue, but if there's a weakness, how to fix it? And, um, you know, as I say, CI, the, the uh, Conference for International Investigators has its own website and there are guidelines that we've worked um, and uh, published on there. Uh, if, if anybody's interested to see how those things can and should be undertaken. Thanks, Duncan. Yes, uh, just for the audience, uh, the CII or Conference of International Investigators um, is a um, sort of conference or group um, that was uh, founded many, many years ago. Um, and it includes uh, um, integrity or investigation offices of various uh, UN entities, um, MDBs, other IFIs, uh, as well as um, other types of international organizations. It is really um, grown quite a bit over the years, um, and it has done some tremendous work in terms of um, harmonizing um, processes and coming up with guidelines of uh, best practices, and Duncan has played an instrumental part, uh, not only in the inception of the CII, but also in uh, formulating a lot of those uh, 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 policies. Um, so, yes, as Duncan mentioned, if anyone is interested, uh, please uh, visit that website, which will um, provide more information and uh, might add some value. Um, so um, just uh, going a bit further in terms of um, the, um, the, the, 
the sort of audit clauses and, and the investigation um, um, related um, clauses. Um, here at the GCF, um, we have a business structure uh, where we enter into partnerships uh, with um, what we call accredited entities. Uh, and uh, we rely a lot upon our accredited entities in terms of uh, project implementation and execution. Um, in our um, agreements with uh, the accredited entities um, based on the GCS policies, um, we uh, require them to investigate allegations of prohibitive practices. Of course, uh, the IIU uh, also has uh, direct investigation um, rights to do so, um, but our um, sort of strategy um, from, from the IIU's uh, perspective is to really try to leverage upon um, the resources um, of our accredited entities to provide assistance where needed uh, in investigating these allegations. Um, in your experience, Duncan, um, where do you think that collaboration, information sharing, um, and potential joint investigations can be of value when it comes to tackling um, allegations of international corruption and fraud? Mike, when I, when I started working at the World Bank in 2000, you know, it was very clear that multinational organizations would try to play one organization off against the other. The, 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 the MDBs all had different definitions. And so we, what we thought was fraud at the World Bank would, be, would not be fraud at the Asian Development Bank or, or might, might not qualify for, for something at the EBRD. And so what we did was we harmonized the definitions in the uniform framework in 2006. And so that made everybody clear about what fraud and corruption was and in future, when there's a communication about fraud and corruption, people all know that it's the same thing in the same place um, in the different projects. And I think it's really important to be consistent because, you know, like young children, you know, multinational organizations can play one team off against the other. A kid, you know, a kid will play the, the father off against the mother. Oh, you know, can I have a can I have a, a sweet? Oh yeah, what did your mum say? Well, your mum said no. That's why I'm asking you. In 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 fact, and um, you know, they they they, until they they keep asking until they get the answer they want, and that's similar to multinational organisations. And I think you know when when we when we're all based around the same sort of documents and the same sort of policies, there's a lot of strength in numbers. There's a lot of consistency. And there's a there's I think a positive um, 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 influence to 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 promoting integrity in these projects. You know what what is not allowed in one project financed by one um, international organization is the same if it was a different project funded by a different organization. So there's you know the harmonization provides a, a great deal of consistency, and I think that's that's really useful. Um, you know, to 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 ensure that um, you know the companies know what is prevented and what they should should and should not be doing, and you know if the technical specifications are required on a particular project, you know that lying and cheating about those um, whether they can meet them in the procurement process or whether they can deliver them in the implementation is a real problem for them. You know, uh, partly because of cross debarment and to the extent that, you know, the MDBs and, and maybe other organizations as well, you know, take a take a note of those entities that are listed on the cross debarment. You know, it's not only about the negative publicity and the recognition that the enter that the 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 company has engaged in fraud and corruption, but it's the wider recognition by the MDBs generally, and that's true of EIB too. EIB doesn't isn't party to the cross debarment agreement because many of the decisions that EIB take are reviewable in a court, uh, the European Court of Justice, and so it's not possible for EIB to be party to the cross debarment. But the conflict, the um, uh, covenant of integrity that um, that EIB uses 
requires them to disclose that as part of their bids. So there is a recognition that if this company has engaged in problematic behavior in the past, they need to be a close eye kept on, on them and on what they do and how they do it. So to the extent that, you know, cross debarment is another way of consistent approach to integrity problems, I, th I think they're very useful. Yeah, I definitely agree. And, um, and, and thank you for that insight. Uh, yeah, the GCF has, in a way, um, try to strengthen um, you know, our relationships when it comes to integrity uh, with all our partners um, through things like capacity building, um, outreach, um, you know, meeting with our integrity counterparts, um, many of whom uh, I believe are in attendance today uh, to try to um, really, you know, coordinate better, to exchange ideas, um, improve information sharing, um, I think the MDVs um, and how they harmonized their approach um, and strengthened their coordination um, serves as a good model um, mm -hmm. for, for us as well um, to, to really um, improve in that area and to uh, leverage off of each other's um, strengths. Um, the audience today, as you know, um, you know involves, um, includes integrity professionals from organizations of various types and sizes uh, around the world. We have um, uh, representatives um, from smaller local entities to, you know, large banks and international organizations. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of our discussion has focused on how fraud and corruption uh, is being handled um, by larger institutions like the MDBs. But I wanted to ask you at this point, um, if you could perhaps provide some insight on um, you know, some ways that the smaller organizations that might not have as robust a risk management system uh, or even a dedicated investigation department um, like some of the international partners um, might apply um, so that they can enhance integrity in, in their project implementation. Micah, I think it's unfortunate of human nature that fraud and corruption will exist around the world. It's not about development and it's not about um, the, the, the size of the company or the agency that's dealing with the issues. So uh, my, my first uh, point would be that each and every agency should be prepared to prevent and deter as well as detect and resolve issues of fraud and corruption. Because as Alan Greenspan said, you know, it's human nature that these things exist. And even when, you know, um, countries try hard, like America uh, and other places, to, 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 to prevent fraud and corruption, they exist, you know, in the US um, college system, in the education system, in the health system. You know, the, the, there's all sorts of uh, um, industrial sectors in which it, it can, can permeate. So fraud and corruption is a problem in 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 developed or, uh, countries as well as developing countries so you know I, I think my first point would be that everybody every agency needs to be able uh to have the ability to try to resolve those things my suggestion on that is that firm and clear and reliable policies for example in in technical specifications in procurement in implementation will minimize the problems. And to the extent that they minimize problems, they will also minimize the integrity issues that may, may crop up. So I'm hoping that strong policies would minimize uh, the, the problems. Uh, I think it's important for small agencies um, to be cautious, but curious and ask lots of questions early on to identify what the problems might be. Um, you know, in terms of compliance, you know, due diligence and KYC, know your customer, um, can be can be important. And so, to the extent that that those things can can have an impact, uh, that's true too. I think another point to bear in mind is that frauds start uh, small, and and only expand if they're not stopped or prevented. So. 
if you discover a fraud, if there is a fraud on something that you identify, deal with it, deal with it strongly, deal with it quickly, because sooner or later, if you ignore it or push it to the back and leave it alone for the for the longest time, it will develop into a bigger, worse fraud. And, and um, it won't be minimized. It won't go away. It'll just become a, a reputational issue. You didn't deal with it when you first became aware of it. So being proactive, I think, is important to reduce and minimize the, those gaps and weaknesses. And I think generally, if things don't smell right or don't work right, there may be problems. And, and you know, ha, ask some questions and, and try to delve into what's happening, because more often than not, there is a problem. And unfortunately, that, that problem can be um, um, based on integrity. Um, uh, problems. Um, I think, you know, th there are international tools out there. It's not just about what the international organizations have done. You know, um, an entity can request that um, um, uh, uh, a company that's bidding for a contract can have ISO 37001. That's an, uh, an ISO standard uh, anti-bribery management system. And that gives a um, uh, a clear indication that the company is unlikely to engage in in corruption on the project. You know that could be a requirement as um, as a qualifier uh, in in a procurement process, uh, or it can be a requirement as sanctions that the company has to do that in order to resolve the problems that have been identified. Uh, third party monitoring. If if there's some doubt about what an an entity is involved in to the extent that the, there can be a third party monitor, um, they can be independent and they can look at what's been uh, undertaken and whether it's reliable or not. You know, compliance I've talked about, you know, there are there is uh, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and, and OECD Convention Against Bribery of Foreign Officials. You know, the, there are a number of, of tools, the World Economic Forum, the EU, um, um directive on whistleblowers whistleblower protection you know there's a bunch of things you know protection of whistleblowers can be a, a very useful way to identify whether there are problems and if if those whistleblowers do come forward on the basis that they're protected that can be a useful um um way of identifying these problems you know there are a bunch of things that can be done it's not easy to identify what should be done in an individual case but there are the there is a, a number of things out there that's available to entities if fraud and corruption have become a problem or or there is a concern that there needs to be some preventive mechanisms put in place to stop them becoming a, a, a problem in the future Thanks, Duncan. Yeah, that's that's some very valuable uh, advice, and um, those are some really good uh, resources um, that you've mentioned. Um, yeah, for our um, colleagues in our accredited entities, if you're interested in learning more, um, please reach out to the IAU or to Duncan, um, and um, I'm sure that uh, we'll be able to provide you um, with um, um, with uh, abundance of resources for you to to refer to. Um, I have uh, now uh, just noticed that uh, there's quite a number of questions uh, that we've received. I still have some questions left, but I think that um, it might be better to focus on um, what uh, our audience is particularly interested in today. So um, at this point, I'll just move on to uh, some of the questions that we've received. Um, one question is um, how, how, are proactive integrity reviews different from internal audit? Um, I think that that's something that uh, a lot of um, people might be curious about. If you could just briefly um, give a explanation for that, we'd okay. appreciate it. Sure. Um, PIRs are, are something that, uh, it's a methodology that's been developed by the investigation unit. This is not a process of accountancy to make sure that what came in went out and what, you know, that the rules have been obeyed 
uh, in terms of accountancy. This is much more investigating. This is much more to identify what the weaknesses are and whether the weaknesses or gaps could be fixed to prevent fraud and corruption in the future. So although it's done with an audit, a sort of audit system process, um, you use investigation methodologies. So you're a lot more skeptical when, when, when the company says, oh yeah, this is resolved this way. Well, let's see, let's see in writing what how that's been resolved in the past. Uh, because, you know, when you're curious, when you look and ask lots of questions, you can find problems and it's very difficult for them to hide on the basis of extensive documentation and site visits. These things can be investigated. It, it's 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 not an accountancy process. It's it's much more about um, forensic um, accounting techniques being applied in an investigative methodology to identify uh, and you know that they may identify fraud and corruption cases already that's already being on the uh, undertaken that's not the aim necessarily um if you use them on high risk projects which eib generally does we we look to to the the risk um of the project before we decide whether or not it's it's something that should be subject to a, um, a pir those those pirs can undertake preventive work it's not just about detection of fraud and corruption but you know the number of cases that investigations at eib ever received from invest from um, accountancy from the auditors was minimal uh, so i'm not saying that audit doesn't have a role in the process of course it's part of the methodology but with an investigative mindset you're always being curious you're always trying to to, to get evidence of what they're asserting are the processes. And if there are weaknesses and there are gaps, those those can be um can be the, the recommendations of the PIR team can fi fix those problems before they are um used uh to, to undertake fraud and corruption. So although they're similar to audit, they're really not an audit process and um with an investigative mindset, these problems can can be useful not just in detection but also in prevention. Yeah, thanks, Duncan. And and just to follow up on that topic, um, we have a question here. Um, PIRs are indeed great tools for deterrence. However, the initial response from organizations potentially subject to PIRs may be one of hesitation. Um, they might ask, are we being investigated or suspicious about why they are the um, target of a PIR? Um, you mentioned um, some very good points just now um, in how PIRs are not necessarily looking to, you know, find, you know, fault um, or try to blame a certain organization. And it's useful, I guess, to um, provide that type of explanation. But the question is, what could be a strong buy-in for stakeholders? Um, is there any, um, you know, way that you can kind of communicate um, this better for those who are subject to a PIR so that they can better cooperate and, uh, you know, be, be willing to, to um, more positively be part of the process? I think the benefit is essentially about the proper implementation of the project. And if if they refuse and, and there are problems identified later, then, you know, the, the, there's no doubt that some of the blame will rest with that entity. But to the extent that the entity is willing to engage in a PIR, then the benefit is that the, the project will be more likely to be implemented properly um, within the technical specifications. Uh, and um, proactive reviews can detect problems. They can uh, detect gaps and weaknesses. And the benefit is that it's the entity's benefit that there won't be any problems on those uh, gaps and weaknesses because the recommendations will strengthen the project and the way it's being, and the, you know, the, the entity, may benefit from that, not just on this project, but in the future. So, you know, there may be ways in which 
the recommendations can affect not just this project, but um, the, 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 the way they work in the future as well. So, you know, there are benefit, benefits to both parties. And it's not about blame. It's not looking to identify, you know, the entity as a fraud and corruption weak uh, entity. It's about trying to strengthen them and make them more suitable, better at implementing the project. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question that I see here is um, one that is kind of related to one that I wanted to ask as well. Um, could you perhaps um, highlight um, some examples of integrity risks um, or explain some unique aspects of climate finance that might require some special care and consideration um, have you seen anything in, in your um, practice in relation to um, specifically climate finance that um, you, um, you know, might have recognized as being unique from <laughs> some of the other international development um, fraud and corruption areas? You know, Mike, I'm not an expert in the environment. I've just had solar panels fitted on my roof, so I'm very happy that I'm more environmentally friendly, but um, I'm not an expert in the environment, uh, but I am happy that Gl uh, Green Climate Fund has the ability to finance projects that will be useful around the world globally. Um, and my take on, on this issue is that, um, you know, the basic fraud and corruption will affect green climate fund as they will anything else people will overstate what they can supply they'll overstate the time it's taken they'll overstate what they can do uh, and you know that that's true in or um, um, uh, green, green climate fund gcf projects as well as you know the world bank and eibs um, they'll pay they'll pay bribes to be awarded a contract and they'll want the prestige of doing a gcf contract which you know it's it's very it's very powerful stuff uh, for for marketing purposes. But if if they're blamed for 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 messing up or paying bribes or or defrauding the project, that's really a very deterring uh, ability that you guys have and the entities have of making sure that they do it properly and by the rules and by the technical specifications that have been envisaged for the project. You know, every project is different. And I I don't recall ever having worked on a climate for a, a climate project, but the the basics of fraud and corruption are this are similar despite the, the you know the the industrial sector, education, health, you know, people build things badly or or the wrong dimensions. You know, I had a school once that was built almost exactly according to the plan but the rooms were smaller, so they needed less tiles and less wallpaper. And the school itself was generally smaller than was supposed to be the case. You know, if you went and looked, you wouldn't have seen that, but it was based on the plans. And, you know, that each room was maybe 10 or 15% smaller. So they were being paid the same. They claimed the same amount of money to build it and decorate it. But the, the, the implementation was, they they were getting 50% profit because of the smaller nature of the rooms. You know, the, these issues will apply to climate fund projects. There'll be false data about what they can do and, and false claims about how they can do it. But it's I think Green Climate Fund is in a good position to be able to know the sort of data that should be supplied to identify a problem and how to rectify it. You know, I'm sure that with the advance of technology, people can make up data and supply it as, as a reason for why a, there should be a project or what the particular solution to the, pro, to the problem is. But, you know, I would cast a doubt on that. I'm, I'm not saying that people will lie automatically to you, uh, but, you know, you have, to, you have to treat the data that they supply with, um, uh, with caution. Are they, is this generally acceptable data or is it stuff that they have found or identified or even made up in order to justify the project that they 
they want to uh, implement. I, I, you know, you have to you have to be very cautious about these things, especially with the impact of AI and and new capabilities. You know, when people can make weird new photos of people and claim they're genuine, you know, people can do all sorts of things and. You know that that doesn't it doesn't help in terms of what the the approach is, but you need to be cautious um, to ensure that the data is realistic and proper, uh, and the implementation of the issues are, are, that are a solution to the to the to the climate problem are, are genuine and not not falsified or made up. Yeah, I think you're entirely um, right on that. Um, and and the types of fraud and corruption schemes um, are, um, in a way, quite similar across you know different uh, areas of international development. Um, and um, you know, as you as you rightfully mentioned, um, you know the fact that um, you know climate change is one of those priority uh, agenda items uh, for the international community and the amount of money that's coming into this field, um, you know, hundred billion dollars a year of, um, you know, um, uh, funding in addition to the ODA that, that was previously provided, I guess, um, provides a lot of um, sort of opportunity for <laughs> the fraudsters to try to take advantage yeah. of. So the risk is very high reputationally and financially, uh, but in terms of really understanding you know, where those risks lie and what types of frauds can be perpetrated. I think that it's good to have a general understanding uh, of what um, schemes have um, occurred in the past and what, um, you know, um, generally um, these our international organizations um, look to identify and combat. So um, for our audience out there, um, um, I mean, please feel free to um, ask us questions, refer to resources that were mentioned by Duncan, also, you know, read his books on fraud and corruption um, to gain that understanding of where um, the, the inherent risks are and how we can um, tackle those, those issues. Um, another question um, that we have is, um, how would you define independence in integrity operations uh, and, and compliance? I think independence, uh, to me at least, is about the objectivity of the decisions. It's not based on a reputational risk or pressure, and it's not based on financial pressure. It's based on what you see, what the evidence suggests has occurred on a particular uh, situation. Um, it's about making those decisions and resolving them. So, you know, are, are you going to sanction somebody? Are you going to are you going to resolve it? Are you going to make referrals to law enforcement in a country or many countries? Um, you know, I, I, I think it's about objectively um, 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 using the, the evidence uh, and what that means in terms of how to resolve the issues. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let me just see... How much time we have left? We have about nine minutes. So I'll just cover a few more questions. Yeah, we have a question actually, and I think that I can address this one. Is GCF part of an agreement uh, for mutual enforcement of debarment uh, decisions? Uh, GCF is not uh, currently part of any cross debarment uh, um, agreement or arrangement. Um, let's see, what are the main causes? Well, well, of well, Mike, I think it's important to recognize that the cross debarment website is available. So if you have access to that and your entities have access to that, you can see it doesn't, it doesn't, the fact that you're not signed up to the cross debarment agreement does not mean that people can't use it for their own benefits in terms of awarding of procurement um, or, 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 or due diligence on projects. I, I think it's, you know, it's accessible. And I've, I've spoken to a number of people in, in various other organizations, the Nordic Investment Bank and various others that use the, the list of cross debarment, even though they're not signed up to cross the bar those companies, 
They use the information. I think the information alone is useful, whether or not you're a party to the cross debarment agreement. That's a good point. And thanks for sharing that, Duncan. Um, another question we have is from your EIB experience, um, uh, what is or what are the main complaint um, or intake channels? Is it the hotline? Is it um, um, EIB monitoring? Um, is it um, other um, sort of avenues of whistleblowing? Um, yeah. We, we at, at EIB, we would receive a number of cases um, per year, a large number of cases, and most of those would come from staff, and most of those would be staff on monitoring missions, so people looking and seeing and finding out about the project uh, and how it's implemented and saying, well, the bridge wasn't supposed to be there or it wasn't supposed to be that thin, it was supposed to be thicker or bigger. or So I, I think your, your own employees, your own uh, contacts in uh, the organization can be a significant source of those problems. Um, complaints externally from people um, on the hotline and on the email um, came in. And sometimes, you know, there are there's a lot of spam, but also occasionally there are a good good cases being referred from an interested party, maybe the losing bidder of a contract. Um, but but also I think, you know, Mike, there's there's a focus on self-reporting now. So I think there will in the future be more companies coming to terms with the fact that they have done wrong in a process, maybe in, in procurement, maybe in implementation. And having identified that, uh, they they come to the integrity units to, to report that and say, look, we, we've identified this, we've we fixed the problems, we've identified what went wrong, we've we we've resolved it, but you know, we wanted to to tell you about it. And you know, I think that might be another source of, of a use, very useful source because, you know, they're not going to lie. They may try to minimize the, the damage, but they're not going to lie about the fact that, you know, what, what's happened and why they're coming to see you. So I think self-reporting is, is another way of, of receiving allegations of cases, um, as well as the PIRs and, and various others that are, are very constructive in terms of trying to resolve the issues before they spring out of hand and become a, a major reputational issue. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, thanks again. Thanks again for uh, all the insight that you've provided. Um, I think that um, that's about all the time that we have. Um, and I guess we'll kind of round things up here. Um, so Duncan, on behalf of the GCF and all our partners around the world, I'd like to express our deep appreciation uh, for your precious time and insights today. This has been a really, really valuable session. Um, and I think that we haven't been able to address all the uh, questions that we have, but um, of course, you know, uh, we need to leave some for next time, right? So <laughs> uh, I've learned a great deal today. I'm sure that our partners learned a great deal on how to strengthen uh, our anti-fraud, anti-corruption initiatives and what resources are available out there, what the importance of um, prevention um, as well as investigation is and how uh, international collaboration can really help us to um, combat um, fraud and corruption and safeguard our, our resources uh, and funding. Um, thank you all for uh, attending today. Uh, we very much look forward to your continued participation. Uh, in future events that are hosted uh, by the IIU. Um, thank you, Duncan. Um, well, I hope Mike, to see you again. I, yeah, please, can I just interrupt you and give yeah. you my thanks? Uh, it's been a, a, a privilege to be able to speak to you and, and the GCF team. And I'd just like to point out to the fact that one of the, the annex of my first book, Promoting Integrity, there's a list of films that people might find useful, not just for their own uh, interest, but also for training purposes to have films um, which involve fraud or corruption. So uh, there's there's been some interest in in that side of the of the book as well as as well as the 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 stuff that I wrote. So, um, but it's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure, and I'm I'm happy um, to be able to 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 raise awareness of these issues and and to try to resolve as many as possible. 
Terrific. Thank you so much, Duncan. Really appreciate it. Um, to our audience out there, until next time, uh, have, a, have a great day, have a great evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you.